On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Marie Singleton Jackson, who was found dead in the trunk of her car on November 16th, 1994. Four days before she was found, Marie had been reported missing by her husband. The day she was last seen, her eight-year-old son had woken up from a nap and found him and his eight-month-old brother home alone. When her husband arrived at the house, he discovered both his wife and her car were missing. He reported her missing the next day, and the search for the missing mother began. But when her body was discovered, detectives began a search for her killer that would take them nearly a decade to find. This is Marie's story. It took 18 long years for justice to be served for the murder of Marie Singleton Jackson, but her story is one that reminds us that no matter how much time goes by, unsolved murders can be solved, and that what is done in the dark will eventually come to light. In 1994, Marie was living in Los Angeles, California with her husband and children, enjoying what seemed like from the outside an idyllic life, a new love, a great career, and a new baby. But before the year was over, Marie would be dead, and the lives of her children and everyone who knew her and loved her would change forever. Marie was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on August 12, 1961. People who knew her described her as a driven and ambitious person who had dreams of one day owning her own business. Her sister said Marie loved to travel and was someone who people were drawn to, She had no problems meeting people and making friends. In the late 80s, she gave birth to her first son, Marcus. Her family and friends said that he was the center of Marie's life. She was a single mother at the time, and so it was just her and her son. In an interview with Dateline for an episode they did about Marie's murder, Marcus said that his mom was a beautiful person who taught him to put people before himself. It's not clear when, but Marie had moved from Philadelphia to Los Angeles, where her and Marcus had settled. By all accounts, in the early 90s, she lived a quiet, happy life with her son. She had begun working for the U.S. government, and most people in her life believed that she worked for the Department of Defense. But Marie actually worked for the CIA as a communications analyst, a top-secret job that she could not tell anyone about. Her job required her to travel a lot, and so Marie would often bring Marcus with her on business trips. And so life was good for her and her son, but there was something missing. She wanted to have someone special in her life. She wanted to get married, and she wanted a family for her son. And so when she met Andre Jackson, she thought she had finally found the one. Friends of Marie's recalled when she told them that she had met someone and they were going on a lunch date. They said she was excited to meet someone new. Andre was a single father of two, and the couple hit it off right away. The relationship moved fast, and her friend said that Marie was smitten, and before they knew it, they had gone from dating to being in love, and then Marie found out that she was pregnant. And even though things were moving fast, it seemed to be everything she wanted. And in March 1994, Marie and Andre secretly got married. Marcus told Dateline that he was at the wedding and his mom looked happy. He said he was happy and he got along well with Andre and was looking forward to having a male figure in the house. After the wedding, the couple lived in a townhouse in Inglewood, California. Andre's two children also lived with them and when Marie gave birth to the couple's son, it solidified their new family It was a big change for Marcus, who up until that point had been an only child. They had gone from a family of two to a family of six in a short period of time. But Marcus said that everyone was happy. He got along well with Andre's children, and he said having a brother and sister was a cool experience. And Andre became like a father to him. Marcus said that he taught him how to swim and how to throw a football and would sometimes ride him on the back of his motorcycle. Blending a family can be hard, but for Marie and Andre, they made it appear seamless. But in 1994, everything for this family changed. 
On Friday, November 11th, 1994, Marcus, who was eight years old at the time, had a day off from school, and so he was home with his mother and younger brother Marquise, who was eight months old. According to court records, Marie and her two boys went shopping earlier that day with a girlfriend of hers. When they got home, Marcus went to his room where he started watching TV. He said that he was watching cartoons and remembered his mom coming to his room and saying something to him. As a distracted eight-year-old, he didn't pay much attention to what his mom had said, but eventually, Marcus fell asleep in his room. Now that evening, Andre's oldest son had a football game that the couple was supposed to attend together. But when Marcus awoke from his nap, he could hear his little brother downstairs crying. When he went downstairs to check on him, he discovered that no one was home. Now, Andre's daughter, who also lived there, was at her grandmother's house that day. And so when Marcus fell asleep, his mom and his little brother were the only people home. But when he realized that Marie wasn't there, Marcus was trying to figure out what was going on. His mom had never left him and his brother alone before. And so at eight years old, he was trying to wrap his head around what was happening. The court records said that Marcus called someone to tell them that he was home alone, but it's not clear who he called. However, after his phone call, the phone at the house rang. It was Andre, his stepdad. Marcus said that Andre asked him if he knew where his mother was or if she was home yet, but she wasn't, and he didn't know where she was. The last time he had saw her was before he had fallen asleep. Now, Marcus said he asked Andre where he was and told him that he was home alone and that the baby would not stop crying. Andre told Marcus that he was on his way home. And when he arrived at the house, Marie's car was gone and she was nowhere to be found. Andre then called a friend of Marie's named Bridget to ask her if she had seen Marie. He said that he had last seen his wife at around 5 p.m. that day, just before he left to go to his son's football game. But now she was gone, and so was her car. Bridget said that she didn't really think much of it when Andre called. She figured that Marie would be back home soon. But after hanging up with her, Andre then took the kids to his mom's house and told her that he was going to Marie's friend's house to see if she was there. Now, although he had already spoken to Bridget, Andre drove over to her home to speak to her in person. Bridget said that once he showed up at her house, she started to think that something might actually be wrong. The fact that Marie still had not returned home was concerning because this was not something that she normally did. In 1994, people were still using pagers to contact each other, and so Bridget paged Marie. She said normally she would call her right back, but when she paged her this time, Marie didn't call her back. Now, the people close to her had a sinking feeling that something was wrong, but their hope was that this was just a misunderstanding and Marie was fine. But by Saturday, November 12th, when Marie still had not returned home or contacted anyone, that hope that they had began to fade. That morning, Andre went over to the home of another one of Marie's friends, the one she had gone shopping with, to ask her if she had seen or spoken to Marie. Her friend Jean said that Andre told her that he and his wife had gotten into an argument and that he had the baby. She said that that's when she knew that something was wrong. And so, like Bridget, she started paging Marie repeatedly, but she too did not get a call back. 18 hours after his wife was last seen, Andre called the Inglewood police at 10.20 a.m. After receiving the call, police were dispatched to the house to get a statement from Andre. He told police that he had last seen his wife at around 5 p.m. on Friday. He said that he had gotten home from work and found Marie there drinking. He said that they got into an argument and that he had left the house and he had gone to his son's football game. But when he returned home, Marie and her gray sob were gone. He told them that he had contacted several of her friends before he called them, but no one knew where she was. Andre gave his initial statement to police, but according to court records, 
He cut the interview short, telling police that he had something to do. But now it was official. Marie had been reported missing, and the search for her began. On Saturdays, Marie had a standing weekly hair appointment that she never missed. And so when she didn't show up for her appointment, her hairdresser called her house to check on her. But when she did, she found out that Marie was missing. Andre told her that Marie had been drinking and had stormed out of the house. But he cut the conversation short by telling her that there was a plumbing problem that he had to deal with. Now, Marie was very particular about her appearance, and so missing her appointment was a huge red flag. She wasn't somewhere blowing off steam. Marie was really missing. After the report was filed, friends and family of Marie's monitored her bank activity to see if she had made any purchases or withdrawals. They also helped Andre create flyers that they could post around the area and hand out to people. Now, Andre suggested that they pass out flyers around the beach and near his mother's house. Her friends, however, thought it was strange of him to suggest the beach since Marie wasn't known to frequent the beach. But with no one having any idea where she was, passing out flyers everywhere seemed important. In the hours following Marie's disappearance, the people close to her were doing everything they could to find her. But there was no sign of her anywhere. Police had spoken to neighbors of Marie's and Andre's to see if they had seen or heard anything, but they had not. And they also searched the area near where she lived, but there were no traces of the missing wife and mother. Over the next couple of days, Marie's family remained in contact with Andre, offering him support and help with finding Marie. On Sunday, November 13th, Marie's hairdresser called Andre again to check in and see what was happening in the search for her. He told her hairdresser during that conversation that he still had not heard from her, but that he had received several pages from a club in Mexico that he thought Marie had gone to with her ex-boyfriend. Now, the revelation from Andre was very weird, and he had not told investigators anything about an ex. It seemed to come out of left field, but... As police dug deeper into Marie's life, they started to learn that her seemingly perfect marriage was anything but that. By Monday, November 14th, there still had been no sign of Marie, and when she didn't show up for work, it prompted concern from her job. Now, remember, Marie worked for the CIA, and she dealt with highly classified information, things that made her vulnerable to terrorists or foreign agents trying to get information out of her. And so when her job discovered her missing, they called the FBI. Whenever someone in a job like Marie's goes missing, the FBI gets involved right away. Perhaps Marie's work had something to do with her disappearance, and that's why they were finding so little evidence. But while the FBI began to look into this mysterious disappearance, Marie's family and friends were desperately searching for her. Most of the people in her life had no idea what Marie really did for a living, and so they weren't making the connection. All they knew at that moment was that Marie would not voluntarily be missing that long unless something was wrong. As two days turned to three, and then four, the urgency to find Marie alive intensified. But on day four of the search a man going for a walk near the beach made a shocking discovery that would turn this case in a new direction. On November 11th, 1994, 33-year-old Marie Jackson Singleton went missing from her home in Inglewood, California, where she lived with her husband and children. But four days after she was last seen, Investigators locate a critical piece of evidence near the beach. After four days of searching and passing out flyers, investigators and Marie's family had been combing the area, hoping that someone had seen something. On November 15, 1994, Andre decided to go to Doc Wheeler State Beach in Los Angeles to post flyers around the area. 
Now, while there, he encountered a man named Timothy who was at the beach taking a walk. Timothy said that he saw Andre posting flyers on a pole in the area, and he said he spoke to Andre, who told him that the woman on the flyers was his missing wife. Timothy said Andre seemed really concerned, and so he took the flyer and continued his walk. Timothy said that after his walk, he went back to his car to head home. And as he turned to head north on Vista Del Mar Boulevard, he noticed a gray Saab parked along the street. Now, he said the car looked eerily similar to the car on the missing person flyer that he had just gotten. When he spotted the car, he made a U-turn and pulled behind the vehicle so he could see the license plate. When he pulled out the flyer he had in his pocket, he saw that the plates matched those on the flyer. Timothy couldn't believe that he had just found the car that was on this missing person flyer, but he was also surprised that Andre, who had just been in the area, had not seen the car because it was the only one on the street. Detectives working the case were not aware that Marie's car had been found at the beach, and neither was anyone else that knew her. But the same day that Timothy located the parked car near the beach, detectives found Marie's credit cards on a ramp in Inglewood, less than two miles from her home. Now, detectives were getting closer to finding Marie. They just had no idea how close. Timothy decided to wait until the next day before calling the police to report what he found. When police received the call, they immediately went to the location and found Marie Saab parked where Timothy had found it. The car was locked, and there were parking tickets underneath the windshield wiper. The driver's seat was tilted forward, and there was a cell phone, although rare at the time, visible on the seat. After the car was found, it was then towed to the impound lot so it could be opened and searched for evidence. Once in impound, police began to process the car. The car had been locked from the outside, but there were no keys found in or near the car. The battery of the car had also mysteriously been removed. After searching inside the car, detectives then popped open the trunk, and inside, they found Marie's body, curled up in a fetal position. She had bruises on her face. It was a shocking discovery, but Marie's disappearance had been solved. Now it was time to figure out what happened to her and how she ended up in the trunk of her own car. When the lead detective returned to the station from the impound lot, he was surprised to find out that Andre was there waiting for him. The detective set Andre down and interviewed him again. He didn't immediately tell him what they had found. He wanted to talk to him again first about the day that Marie disappeared. Andre said that that night he left work at 5 p.m. and arrived home between 5.10 and 5.15. He said that he had planned to go to his son's football game with his wife, but when he got home, she had been drinking, and so he told her to stay home. He said they then got into an argument, and he left. And he said that Marie was supposed to pick up his daughter from her grandmother's house, but she never arrived. And when he returned home after the game, she was gone. After the detectives heard Andre's account of that evening again, they then informed him that Marie's car had been found and that the body of a woman was inside the trunk. Detectives said that Andre immediately became hysterical, dropping to the floor, kicking and screaming. The detectives said that Andre seemed over the top, and he ended up having to end the interview. In all the years that the detectives had been working, he said that he had never seen a man act like that during a death notification. Now that Marie had been found, however, the investigation had shifted to a homicide case. The autopsy revealed that Marie had been beaten and then strangled to death. Nothing had been stolen, and so robbery was ruled out as a possible motive. There were also no signs of a sexual assault, and Marie's body was fully clothed when she was found. 
DNA had been collected from underneath her fingernails, and there had been a drop of blood that was scraped off the hood of the car. And so detectives had something, but they needed a suspect. As part of their investigation, detectives had been taking a closer look into Marie's life and her marriage, and they had learned some interesting things about Andre and Marie's relationship. In the months before her disappearance, Marie and Andre's marriage was falling apart. Friends said that Andre was controlling, and the couple argued a lot. During one of those arguments in October 1994, the police were called, but no one was arrested. Marie had been confiding in her friends that she was planning to leave Andre. Detectives began to become suspicious of Andre's involvement in his wife's murder. Jean, Marie's friend that Andre went to visit the morning he reported her missing, told detectives that when he came to her door, she noticed that he had a busted lip. He told her that he had gotten it playing football, but Jean didn't believe him. Another friend told detectives that they remembered seeing a huge dent in the wall of the couple's bedroom the Monday after Marie went missing. Suspicion around Andre was growing. His behavior, coupled with what they were learning from Marie's friends, were making detectives take a closer look at him. As part of their search for answers, detectives had obtained Andre's phone records and discovered that he had only tried to call his wife once after she went missing. Detectives found that strange because usually, when you're concerned about a missing loved one, you call them repeatedly. But Andre had only tried to call his missing wife one time. The detectives weren't the only ones becoming suspicious of Andre. Her friends and family were too. Marie's sister had come to L.A. from Philadelphia when her sister was found, and she had been talking to Marie's friends as they tried to comfort each other and find out what happened to her. But once they all started talking and comparing information, they had learned from Andre, they started to realize that Andre had been telling different people different stories about the last time he saw his wife. The people close to Marie were beginning to believe that Andre may be involved in Marie's murder. And so her sister decided to call detectives and tell them what she had learned. But Investigators had already begun looking at Andre and told Marie's sister that he was a suspect and that they may arrest him at Marie's funeral. But Andre was not arrested at Marie's funeral. And when he was informed that he was the prime suspect in his wife's murder and asked if he had any information that would help eliminate him as a suspect, Andre told the detective that it wasn't his job to help them investigate this murder. Detectives were sure that Andre was involved, but there was not enough evidence to connect him to her murder, and so there was nothing detectives could do at the time. After Marie's funeral, Marcus went back to Philadelphia to live with his aunt. He said he kept in touch with Andre, who had become like a father to him. Eventually, after hitting a dead end in the investigation, the case was closed by the Inglewood Police Department was beginning to feel like Marie's family would never get answers or justice. The years were hard. Andre had moved out of California and police had lost contact with him. Marcus grew up haunted by his mother's murder, and her family prayed that one day they would get closure. And after eight long years with nothing, an FBI agent who had never forgotten about Marie's murder decided to take another look at her file. He reached out to the Inglewood PD and spoke to one of the lead detectives on the case from 1994. And they sat down together and went through the evidence that they had collected all those years before. They discovered that the DNA collected from underneath Marie's fingernails had never been tested because the technology had not existed in 1994. But in 2002, they could have it tested. The problem was the crime lab was backed up and a nearly decades-old case was not a priority. It took another five years after the case was reopened to get the results tested. 
They tested both the fingernail scrapings and the blood drop found on the hood of Marie's car. And the results came back stating that the DNA was from the same man. The investigators were positive that they knew who that man was. They believed it was Andre Jackson's DNA. But they had no samples from him to compare the results to. They tried to locate him, but were unsuccessful. However, they were able to locate his son, and he agreed to give them a sample of his DNA to test. When the results came back, it was positive for a familiar match. And that was enough to finally secure a warrant for Andre Jackson's arrest. Detectives were able to track Andre down, who had moved to Arizona, and he was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. It took another four years for Andre to stand trial for his wife's murder. The prosecution argued that Andre had killed his wife after learning that she had planned to leave him. They presented evidence and testimony about a jealous, abusive husband who couldn't handle his wife leaving him. The defense argued that Andre was innocent and that the prosecution's case was weak and mostly circumstantial. But the DNA evidence and the testimony from Marcus about what he remembered from that time was enough to convince a jury that Andre was guilty. It took them only three hours to hand down their verdict, and Andre Jackson was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to 25 years to life. It took nearly two decades for Marie's case to come to a close. There were times when it seemed like police would never arrest her killer. But when the people involved in a case refuse to give up, it can be solved. Marie's life ended in such a brutal way. She had been married to Andre for less than a year, but she had married a monster. Andre has maintained his innocence, and there is no way to know why he killed his wife. But no matter his reason, her murder was senseless. Like I said in the beginning of Marie's story, this is one that is proof that even after decades, a cold case can be solved. Marie and her sons deserved much more than they got. Marie was looking for a protector, someone she could raise a family with. But instead, she met and married a man that killed her and stole her away from her children who have had to live their lives without her. Hopefully, the arrest and conviction of her murderer has given her family some closure to this devastating tragedy. May Marie Singleton Jackson rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads. 